I think we shall get started. It's 6 p.m. and I'm off camera right now, but my name is Michael Rooks, the Wheeling Family Curator of Contemporary and Modern Art at the High Museum. Thank you all so much for uh, joining us for tonight's conversation with Julie McGee, curator of David Driscoll, Icons of Nature and History. Before we get started, we're looking at two paintings in the exhibition that will begin the exhibition uh, um, because I think we'd like to just uh, honor uh, David's contributions and his family's contributions to the exhibition. But before we get started, I'd just like to give a special thanks to High Museum members in attendance this evening. Um, your support is invaluable and it fuels everything that we do. And a special thanks to any friends of contemporary art who are in the audience as well. If you're not yet a member or you need to renew, please visit high.org at the end of this program. David Driscoll, Icons of Nature and History, the exhibition represents an overview of Driscoll's remarkable career as an artist. Through his work as an historian, curator, teacher, he indelibly expanded the story of American art and the distinguished and indispensable contributions of black artists to that narrative. But perhaps lesser known is David's own contribution to his history as an artist. So this, the exhibition surveys seven decades of Driscoll's practice from 1953 to 2011 and considers his abiding interest in the natural world, the aesthetics and images of the African diaspora, aspects of the Southern Black experience, the Black Christian Church, and his own family history. Indeed, the exhibition uh, shows that David Driscoll's story is an American story. And I'm really pleased to be joined tonight by art historian, curator, and educator, Dr. Julie McGee, whose contributions to the unfolding histories of African-American art and contemporary African art have made their own important imprint upon the foundation that David Driscoll established. Her book, David Driscoll, Artist and Scholar, was published in 2006, and it introduced David Driscoll, the polymath, to a much broader audience beyond that of the Konyashenti, who are already familiar with David's uh, extraordinary achievements. She joined the University of Museums at the University of Delaware as curator of African-American art in 2008, after a dozen years on the faculty of Bowdoin College, where she incidentally met David. And she was also a Rockefeller Foundation Fellow at the Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage. In addition to her teaching and her research, she is currently the director of the University of Delaware's Interdisciplinary Humanities Research Center where she also oversees the Paul R. Jones Initiative. So Julie, welcome back to Atlanta. I know you're in a, uh, a frozen place right now, the frozen tundra of, of Delaware, but uh, thank you for joining us and welcome back. Thank you, Michael. And I want to give my special thanks to the staff at the High and also to the Portland Museum of Art in Maine who invited me into this collaboration with David Driscoll. And I want to just begin before Michael and I give you a live rolling tour, <laughs> iPad rolling tour of the exhibition. Um, I wanted to thank the, well, I wanted to thank David Driscoll himself. And I want to thank the Driscoll family in particular. And we're looking at two works that belong to the Driscoll family, um, a self portrait from 1956 on the left which if it was not part of this exhibition would be hanging in their sunroom. So for me, it's particularly poignant um, to see it here as part of the exhibition and where I know it is both loved and missed by the family home, as well as Boy with Birds on the right-hand side from 1953. So to the Driscoll family, Thelma, Dabreen, Darius, and to Rodney Moore, who have been incredibly significant to David Driscoll's career as an artist, but also for allowing us to continue with this exhibition after David Driscoll's death to COVID-19 circumstances. So I, I am truly thankful to be able to share in the life and the artistry of David Driscoll with you, his family. So let's get started, Michael. Let's let's go over to City Quartet. Let's do it. So we're going to go to City Quartet uh, right now. Uh, City Quartet uh, is a painting in the, the first section of the exhibition. Uh, it is organized chronologically, as I mentioned, 
from 1953 to 19 or 2011, which is the latest painting in the exhibition. Uh, and City Quartet is the painting on my left, uh, a figurative uh, group um, that was painted by Driscoll uh, upon his return from Skowhegan. Is that correct, uh, Julie? That's right. If if you imagine being in this gallery with us, the exhibition is set up so that it is, it's chronological as Michael suggests, but it's loosely chronological. And in the first gallery, we are looking at works primarily made by David Driscoll when he was a student at Howard University where he did his, his undergraduate work. Um, and as a junior, he went to Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in 1953, uh, and then returned to Howard to finish out his education there. So th in many ways, the exhibition, as you approach it from the beginning, is asking us, asking you to think about what it was like for this Georgia-born, um, Eatonton, Georgia, born in 1931, moves to North Carolina at the age of five. After graduating from high school, he takes the train up to Washington, DC and enrolls at Howard University. So we've included works from that time period to give us a sense of his early training and the types of artistry that he was introduced to while at Howard University, printmaking, painting, color theory, um, influenced by James Porter, Lois Maylou Jones, and uh, James uh, Lysine Wells, who was a printmaker. And this work in particular, what we see is the influence of Jack Levine, an artist whom he met at the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in 1953. Many of us know Skowhegan as a place today where professional artists go, including young professional artists. In the 1950s, it was often a place where graduating seniors would go, rarely a junior. And it became a place for which Driscoll not only fell in love with Maine, it, it began a lifelong relationship with Maine, but he also felt that it was a place where he could position himself and understand himself as a professional artist. He liked, and it's, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, it's interesting as well because he paint, painted this just after coming back from Skowhegan, the first trip he made to New York City. And it, it reveals this immediate in, influence of uh, Jack Levine at Skowhegan, Jack Levine's social realism, uh, as well as Jack Levine's style of painting, right? That, that David really seems to have absorbed uh, during his uh, time at Skowhegan. Indeed, he envisioned himself to be a social realist painter in the vein of Jack Levine, um, but with someone who would tell his own story. But you also see him working with a heavy impasto, um, what we call a light dark palette, which he had learned from Lois Jones, but it was also something that uh, Jack Levine had done. And you're right, Michael, his trip to Skowhegan, Maine uh, afforded him the first opportunity to travel in the US north of Baltimore. And he, con when he concluded his nine weeks at Skowhegan, he traveled back down through New York City. So in City Quartet, as, as well as a few other works from this early period, he's absolutely fascinated by the urban landscape. So we see behind these four figures, tall buildings, um, a fire hydrant, um, what appears to be a, a bridge. So he's thinking about um, his own positionality in the city as a professional black artist in the company of these three other white male figures. How will he navigate the path forward as a professional artist? And the still life in the center of the painting is so interesting to me, the still life of hands, which seems so astute in terms of art history because that's uh, often something you see in these studies of hands, the still lives of hands that uh, suggest thought processes, but also these are the instruments of artists and thinkers, right? Exactly. And I think what is very apparent, even in this early work from 1953 is David Driscoll was an artist who was 
not particularly interested in illusionistic space. Yes, we have a sense of a cityscape in the background, but it's quite flat. Um, and perhaps the, the hands that we see that remind us of the profession um, and then in connection with the sort of cognitive, um, those large heads, right? That an artist is also an um, intellectual pursuit. Those provide a kind of spatial relationship, almost a kind of circular interaction. But he was always moving between a sense of flatness and um, illusionism. So that in many ways, we would think about David Driscoll as an artist who was very much interested in modernism. Um, and this is not to say that he was not capable of creating very realistic illusionistic space, but he saved that mostly for his drawings. Right. And you mentioned the sort of circular forms of the heads, these volumes that are in the top uh, quarter of the painting, which to me suggests a sort of a foreshadowing of the, the importance of this motif uh, in his career later, not, not much longer. Uh, after 1953, he starts to really think about the, the circular form, uh, whether it's in the, uh, whether the subject is the moon or the sun uh, or uh, another uh, formal motif. It's something that uh, this painting seems to suggest uh, will reappear, as well as the frontal form, which I think you'll probably be talking about soon as we get to uh, Behold Thy Son, but the, the frontality of the central figure uh, yeah. seems to augur that. So Michael's offering you the way in which we can think about this single painting as opening up on the entire career of Driscoll, right? Someone who's going right. to move between flatness and figuration, an artist who's interested in hieratic form, who will think about a central emphasis that is often vertical with horizontal axes. But we can also think about this. So the an overarching um, theme of the exhibition is rethinking the positionality of American art through historically black colleges and university. So when I look at this painting, I try to imagine what would it have been like for David Driscoll, a junior in college at Howard, a historically black college, to have traveled north to Baltimore to be at Skowhegan, where the only other black artist that was there that summer was Walter Williams, and they were roommates. So I think this also plays out in terms of him finding a place within what would have been, ver been very much a white male professional world. Um, so that too, you know, we can see that um, social historical relationship to himself in the professionalism of an American artist, that very distinct difference between being at Howard and then being um, in Maine. Absolutely. And maybe this is a good opportunity to move uh, into the gallery and look at Young Pines Growing, um, which is painted six years later in 1959 and is in the collection of Clark Atlanta University's museum, which is right here. Um, and you mentioned, Julie, uh, the idea of hieratic form. And would, would you mind if I ask you to kind of uh, flesh that out for us. I, I believe it was something that uh, was first applied to David's work uh, with Keith Morrison's writings. That's right. So Keith Morrison, artist, curator, and colleague of David Driscoll, first pointed to this penchant, this interest for Driscoll in creating what he would call hieratic forms that are akin to, say, Byzantine painting, in which you have uh, a figure, in this case, we have pines. We have a, a, an object, for example, that will oscillate um, in a very narrow plane, often with a very frontal presentation, and that it keeps you almost mesmerized within the object itself. So that idea of a kind of oscillating, largely planar frontal um, object, and in some ways, thinking about it in terms of Byzantine or even a devotional imagery. It's something that you've mm. written about, Michael, in terms of David Driscoll's work, in terms of you know, painting as liturgy, so yeah. that you remain within the refrain. And in this particular case, um, Young Pines Growing, this was painted at um, Talladega College, where Driscoll went with his family after graduating from Howard University. It was his first teaching job. 
and he takes up that position in 1955. And of course, what's happening nearby, so he's in Talladega, Alabama, but nearby Hill Woodruff, who started the Atlanta annuals at uh, Atlanta University, now Clark Atlanta, a significant showcase for African-American artists who at the time did not have a, a number of venues to actually show their work to the public. So indeed this particular painting, which is in, remains in the uh, Clark Atlanta collection, won the first prize for landscape painting. And here we see Driscoll really interested in Cezanne, for example, um, facet cubism, but he would also say, and what we didn't mention in terms of his Howard experience, he was introduced at Howard to African art, not only through James Porter, but through the African art collection there. So he's interested in um, sculptural planarity and how that can actually then become part of painting. Um, and then the pine trees, something that he knows both from North Carolina, but also began painting when he was up at Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine. Right, so I think that's a fascinating uh, aspect of this early part of the exhibition, uh, that it show, reveals uh, all of these different influences that David's negotiating early in his career, you know, from uh, his introduction to African art to social realism to the, uh, the philosophy, the, the approach uh, to painting the landscape of, of Cezanne, uh, which um, essentially uh, attempted to give you multiple uh, perspectives or points of view of a single object, uh, while at the same time still advancing this idea of the hieratic form, this uh, Byzantine-like frontal uh, form that has in its own integrity uh, something that's as you said, mesmeric. Yeah, indeed. There, you, and you also uh, touched upon the idea of a, a, a kind of a spirituality that comes into play when we're talking about the pine tree paintings. And next door, uh, next door, two, two pictures down, there's this beautiful drawing you and I both love, which is a landscape drawing. And it's just interesting to me that within this wonderful uh, landscape, uh, made with charcoal and, and ink on paper uh, from 58. So a year prior to young pines growing, you see this landscape made with uh, lines that are uh, uh, horizontal and vertical, but also some curvilinear forms. But in the center, the tree almost starts to take the shape of a cross, the cross itself right here, um, which to me suggests uh, his conflation of these ideas of, of the crucifix, the cross, and the image of a pine tree as something that uh, is symbolic. So this is, it's hard to see in um, Can you scooch those, of you, yeah, those of you who have an opportunity to see the exhibition at the high or as it travels, um, or even the exhibition catalog, because there's a beautiful two page spread of this um, image. What really strikes me about this particular work when I look at it is, you know, you could, I could, knowing David Driscoll's work, even turn it so it's vertical and right. then it starts to take on another aspect of pine trees. But even more so is those strokes, each are, are very different. Some are curvilinear, some are straight and parallel lines. And when I see them, they look exactly like some of the new growth of pine trees when the needles mm -hmm. stick straight out and they're quite parallel. So there's this interest for me in how he's able to completely imitate nature but not have it be illusionistic. So it's capturing that feel um, that he was able to do early on. This is a, a drawing from 1958, I believe. Right, exactly. And, and adjacent to it is this other drawing that is vertical just to, to uh, give you a a glimpse at fir trees from 55, a few years earlier, uh, to uh, you were mentioning we could turn untitled 58 on its end. Mm -hmm. And in this case, uh, essentially, David does this uh, with the image of a, a pine tree. And that's um, a pastel drawing, which um, I'll just use as a um, device to say that the exhibition showcases a variety of media that Driscoll worked in because at Howard, again, thinking about his training, 
um, that he learned oil painting and caustic. He learned um, printmaking. Uh, he learned color theory. So he was not only an artist, he was well, well versed in very traditional foundational forms of art making, but he also is an artist who loved to experiment as, we, as you see through over the course of his career. And experimenting with formal ideas too, as you were uh, describing earlier with facet cubism in this case, and with pictorial space, the tree is anchored on the ground plane. Could we go just to the Morgan State um, yeah. gallery? Um, Let's go down. Just so I can make one other um, point about the multiple things that are happening in the exhibition. This is another uh, pine tree of David Driscoll's that he painted while he was at Talladega that was part of his MFA thesis that he got from Catholic University of America, which he received in 1962. And he did his thesis on the evergreen, um, a tree, and this gets back to what you're talking about in terms of spirituality, Michael, a tree that remains green throughout the seasons and is has a number of symbolic iterations and not just in um, Christian thought, but across religious um, thinking. And this tree, one of the things I love about this tree, there are these connections that, that um, one can make in the gallery. This tree was on an exhibit, the second exhibit at the Barnett Aiden Gallery, which is a, was a Washington DC gallery where he also um, was a director and worked when he was a young um, student at Howard University. So it brings back this connection to um, Howard, but it was made at Talladega, um, and now it is in um, Baltimore at Morgan State University. So we continuously return to his HBCU roots. Of course, the other funny thing I like about this painting, it was actually illustrated um, in the Washington Post because his exhibition got reviewed, but the painting was printed upside down. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Even though it has a signature there. So yeah. I it's sort of, you know, misunderstood abstraction. Um, <laughs> but there you see that circular form, Michael, that you yeah, right here. On the left hand corner. Right. Yeah. It starts to emerge in this painting and is, is uh, has a stronger presence in uh, several other paintings, uh, particularly the Portland Museum of Arts painting here, where it starts to become something that is almost uh, retinal, a retinal kind of image in the upper right. Exactly. And you, often we get asked why, um, and I, I suppose um, Driscoll himself may have been asked this question, but I certainly have been asked it often, um, most recently about why Driscoll would paint pine trees during the height of the civil rights movement, right? He moves to Talladega with his family to teach in 1955, just when the bus boycotts begin, right? Um, right. Emmett Till is brutally murdered. And he continues to find pathways to um, create these hieratic, symbolic, beautiful pine trees. That's not that he doesn't also make social commentary images, but that they re re are a persistent form in his work. Right. And that's a good segue for us to perhaps turn our uh, screen around and go over to Behold Thy Son. Uh, because social commentary uh, first appears early in his work after his uh, time at Skowhegan and his introduction to Jack Levine's work. But it's something that he returns to. He doesn't, uh, of course, abandon the idea of addressing the vicissitudes of, of inequality and injustice. Um, and particularly in 1956, when this painting was made, Behold Thy Son, uh, which is a response to the brutal murder of Emmett Till. You make a, such a beautiful comparison in the catalog, uh, Julie, uh, between this painting and Young Pines Growing, which we were just talking about. Would you care to talk about that a little bit? Sure. So in this particular painting, I think we can easily focus on this bruised body, right? That um, like the, like Christ who's been crucified, who's being held up in these arms of a figure in the back. Um, and what you can't quite, you may not be able to make out on camera, there's a sarcophagus and there's a candelabra. 
but you also see the spine, the centrality of this figure, and then the horizontal um, movement of the arms. They very much are the same form of the pine trees, right? So you have this um, very strong vertical force, um, which is inflected by these this horizontal imagery, and then even the the figure behind that almost presents um, the be, that is behold thy son. I'm presenting it to you, right? Right. For me, it's a a, a comfortable. It's becoming a comfortable. Um, a formal device for Driscoll that is also very much tied into keeping us within that image, right? That we stay with it, whether it's the um, pine tree or the body of Emmett Till or a symbolic representation of that. Yeah. Right. I thought it was interesting, We uh, the drawing that is in the Library of Congress that we were unable to get because of COVID, uh, but we've illustrated it on a label. No point in trying to show you that on the screen because it's uh, probably wouldn't come out too well. But what's interesting to me is that the, the cross that uh, Christ is crucified on in this drawing, this study for the painting, is itself a tree. Uh, yeah. Coming back to that earlier drawing, we we're just talking about that uh, 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 ink and uh, graphite drawing. Uh, where the, the cross is uh, conflated in this landscape with uh, new growth uh, on pine trees. Um, so this is painted in 56 and uh, adjacent to it across the gallery is a painting made in 64, uh, same subject matter. Um, and that's called Black Crucifixion and we'll go over and talk about that. So from his position at Talladega College, uh, Driscoll and his family go back to Howard University where he will teach for four years um, and in the 60s. And there are two paintings. We're actually looking at the Black Crucifixion and then hanging next to that is uh, Gabriel, both of which were uh, painted while he was at Howard. And in this case, it's a painting that um, is, not so much a direct reference to Emmett Till, but more a continuation of what Driscoll would call a social crucifixion. So painted in 1964, um, as you mentioned, Michael, thinking about um, not only the civil rights movement, but in this case, when, you, in your, when you're in the gallery, you can see it a little bit better, but there's a the face of this figure stares out directly at you in almost, depending upon how you feel about it, it's, you know, sort of, so what is your position? So here we have Driscoll favoring what we might think of as a, almost a stained glass style that calls out to Georges Rouault, who was a French painter that he admired. Um, but again, that hieratic mesmeric form, so the, the, crucifixion, the black crucified um, figure is hemmed in by these beautiful um, geometric patterns of blue and red and white. And then we, we focus on the skeletal body um, of the figure, which if you spend time in the gallery, I'm gonna encourage you to think about the way he has made the, the ribs and the legs, for example, right? That mm -hmm. those actually are just these beautiful calligraphic lines. They, they, rec they very much showcase um, his sense of creating a quality of line and you'll see some of that repeat. So how does that become, in this case, a figure, um, a leg, an arm, but in another case, it's a column, right? Or it's a decorative element. Right. And this painting, if you think about Behold Thy Son from 56, this painting made in 64, is so visceral. It almost feels uh, violently visceral to me. Uh, the figure itself seems flayed because we see the sort of skeletal structure of, of the body. Uh, whereas Behold Thy Son almost feels, uh, it feels very tender, like a conventional or traditional pieta uh, with a Madonna, you know, cradling her son. Uh, in this case, I, I, I think of a host of art historical um, references or uh, allusions perhaps uh, in this work, uh, most 
immediately for me uh, in the Northern Renaissance uh, or in um, sort of Enlightenment era uh, uh, work of Rembrandt um, with those famous hanging sides of beef. Right, and in fact, uh, 1964, um, during the summer, David Driscoll had a study tour to the Netherlands. He spent time um, in Amsterdam and in The Hague. He was researching artist archives. He was actually specifically looking at um, Rembrandt prints in the Rijksmuseum. Um, and one of it, for one of his exhibitions um, at DC Moore Gallery in New York a few years ago, um, John Yao wrote, wrote this um, really interesting review in which he thought about the ways in which Driscoll sort of absorbed so many, sort of a cauldron of styles, right? And then yeah. made them his own. So I think that's very much um, a part of this work that it will reference his deep art historical knowledge, um, but right. still sing his own voice. Absolutely. And as you start, as the, the sort of visceral form of the body starts to be, you know, come into focus, you're mentioning how uh, it's framed by this uh, geometric uh, composition of the painting. Uh, ultimately, your eye does go up to the face of the crucified figure who is looking directly at you, as you pointed out, which is really powerful. Uh, for, for me, it feels as almost as if uh, asking about one's complicity. You mentioned, you said, what's your position? He's asking perhaps, what is your position? Uh, or, or also serving as a witness or asking uh, you to consider your own uh, complicity uh, right. in these systems. And I think that's where it's, iconographically related to how he presents Emmett Till, but it speaks to a much larger social issue beyond just an homage um, to Emmett Till. Absolutely, it's super powerful when that realization comes to you as you're looking at the painting. Um, shall we move into the next gallery? Yes. Uh, it's a good so, segue because the next gallery is about uh, the so-called turbulent decade between 1963 and 73. In this gallery, we are going to follow David Driscoll's move. There are some there are some works in here that still pertain to the Howard University time period, but I think what we're going to focus on here tonight um, are the ten years that he spent at Fisk University, um, which in my mind have been are among the most important pivotal years for him, both as an artist and as an art historian. It's from there that he plots out and works on the famous two centuries of Black American art, um, which after it opened in Los Angeles, exit was shown at the, the High Museum of Art. What you're seeing here are two assemblage and collage paintings that David Driscoll made while he was at Fisk. And they're reunited here. These are in two different collections. The work on the left is a, in the Colby College Museum of Art, um, the collage. And then on the right, the Black Ghetto belongs to Fisk University Art Galleries. Um, but David Driscoll always spoke about them as a, as a companion, um, not so much stylistically, um, you would probably piece of how are these a companion that's not a diptych, but that they speak to the era um, of the I weave, the smaller collage on the left really picks up the Vietnam War, which was um, significantly protested at the same time that we have the civil rights movement and also the black power movement that's happening. Um, and the, um, this collage element that includes um, newsprint and uh, several iterations uh, um, of the American flag that are um, positioned around some calligraphic lines that create a figure that is actually weeping. And then the text of the I weep repeats itself and then a smaller newsprint piece refers to the failed war policy um, in the US. And what's significant is that David Driscoll is reminding us that, you know, we are in this failed war in Vietnam at the same time that we are 
um, still struggling for civil rights, right? So among the uh, issues that he's thinking about is patriotism, nationality, internationalism. Um, by this time, um, Driscoll is, is really kind of situated at Fisk University and all of these things are being debated, right? And contested um, on the campus of Fisk University in Nashville and elsewhere. And if we move to the right, um, to the other um, painting at Fisk University, this assemblage painting. Do you want us to move in closer, Julie? Is that okay? That's okay. It's it's reflective, okay. so it's um, for those yeah. of you who are seeing this, you might wonder why am I seeing um, the curator, my my colleague, yeah, reflected. Is it has a <laughs> lucite case over it because it is an assemblage. Uh, painting that has most directly um, in the center is a silhouette of a young black figure, which David Driscoll describes as himself young, a kind of young man um, hemmed in, and a kind of psychological hemmed in um, in terms of racism in the US. And he's hemmed it in with um, a piece of wood, a book, a rotary dial, um, decorative objects. And he is exploring painting without painting in some ways. Um, this, the, it is the central piece that is painted the most, but he's rethinking the nature of painting and painting as assemblage. Um, and it's a historic moment in American art um, where this is happening too, in terms of is painting dead, right? Um, and right. what happens to, to Driscoll at Fisk is this much heightened attention to collage and assemblage, like disassembly and reassembly. And uh, right, and it also suggests uh, his later interest in collage painting. I think he, he uh, started exploring this obviously around this time. Um, but the use of objects in terms of assemblage uh, seems to go away uh, and is replaced by his interest in uh, collage with paper uh, and his use of paper and other materials and techniques um, and ex experimentation, uh, experimentation with different techniques. Um, it's, we have this adjacent to another painting, Gate Lake Table, um, which uh, was purposeful. Uh, we wanted to also show that David was thinking about assemblage different traditions of assemblage. Uh, we typically think of assemblage in terms of the surrealist, uh, surrealists in the early 20th century, uh, or in terms of American history, uh, we think of uh, someone like Robert Rauschenberg or even earlier Joseph Cornell. Uh, but David's influence was black folk art and craft uh, in terms of his knowledge and, and uh, familiarity with artists who are doing this, you know, outside of, of those uh, West or Euro-American art traditions. Well, and that, this particular work, Gate Lake Table, which is at the Hood Museum in Dartmouth, it is kind of funny, right? It, it is assemblage. It's also sort of abstract expressionist in the center. This was made at Howard. It was from pieces that he collected. Um, the family actually owned a Gate Lake Table. Um, and one of the um, things that Driscoll did throughout his life was often work on series. So this belongs to what he would call his Americana series, which is also featured in the exhibition. And that would be chairs, tables, still lives. Um, he was absolutely fascinated. Um, I don't know if we'll see it tonight, but he is an artist who appreciated the beauty of craft, right? The beauty of objects. Um, so later he will recreate chairs himself without the parts of chairs, right? But he will do it through um, tearing up paper um, and collaging them. So his right. interest in furnishings, I think, had to do with um, the appropriateness of beauty for a fine form that is also useful. And one form that he's, he found uh, great beauty in uh, is the, the female form 
Um, I know we didn't talk about this in our last uh, tour, Julie, but since they're just adjacent here, maybe we can just quickly uh, talk about his use of collage uh, in terms of the, these paintings uh, of women, so sort of his canon of uh, female figures. Sure, so he has a series, a um, Black womanhood series, and in uh, Women in Interior, and then also to the right of that, Women with Flowers, um, we see these amazing collage paintings that Driscoll was working on um, while he was at Fisk that combine a um, expressionistic painting with pieced paper that he's cut from um, commercial print magazines, as well as in many cases, his own prints. So David Driscoll learned printmaking at Howard. And at this point in time, he's making his own prints. He's keeping the blocks, he's reusing them. But then for some of the prints that he actually pulled from his blocks, he will then tear them up and use them as collage. So this um, print here appears in Woman in Interior and not always in obvious places. So in this case, the head wrap um, is actually the face that appears in the print to the left. So there's a kind of um, clever, ingenious, almost I sometimes wonder, was he laughing in the studio when he did that? Like, would somebody notice um, that that was actually half of a face up there that becomes this beautiful pattern um, in the scarf? And what this does for me when I look at his work is because his prints, often in black and white, show his beautiful quality of line and calligraphy, that it becomes a way when he reuses those prints to import that directly into the collage painting. So you've got this reiteration of his line and color. And then you see also in this work, A Woman in Interior from 73, the re returning influence of someone like Lois Mailer Jones with the, the decorative patterning, uh, of course, the color sensibility, um, but a really wonderful. Uh, painting, powerful. Maybe. So sorry. I was just going to suggest the um, Birmingham piece. So you could show the wood block. Yes. Okay. So I just want to show you something that's that we particularly love about this exhibition. So part of the um, ghetto wall series um, that includes the Black Ghetto at Fisk is this Birmingham, um, owned by the Birmingham Museum of Art Ghetto Wall. But what you see in this particular image, um, again, if you look for the black and white patterns, those are David Driscoll's prints interspersed in this beautiful sort of horizontal swath of color. Then he also has print magazines. There's a young um, girl standing um, in what appears to be an alleyway. But the head on the right-hand side, the face of this figure who is blocked by this sort of colorful collage assemblage is from um, a wood block, a print pulled from a wood block. And we actually have the wood block in the gallery itself. It's a print that would become known as Banyan Woman. And I don't think you can see it because the yeah. color is too high. But right. at least you have an opportunity to kind of see um, here's a, a wood block that he worked on in the 60s that becomes the basis for these the beautiful um, uh, Bainian woman, which he does both in black and white and sometimes hand colors them. But then imagine him taking those very prints themselves and then incorporating them into his collage paintings. So you can see the kind of artistic process and the, and the sort of very creative um, ingenuity um, of his thinking and his reuse of um, both material that he makes of his own or print material that is commercial. Right, so it's a, a wonderful uh, opportunity to see this painting with the block on the right with the face and then African, the print, woodblock print from 72, uh, which appears in these different uh, areas of the painting. And I should Let's go. That, yeah, I know you're gonna go to the African section, right? Um, yes. Right. So that's, uh, as you're walking over there, I will just um, remind our viewers that um, during those, the 10 years that 
um, the Driscoll family was at Fisk, um, David Driscoll took his first trip to the continent of Africa in um, December of 1969 and was there through um, January 1970. He will return there in 1972. And those visits were particularly important, not to introduce him to the arts of Africa. He certainly had known them at Howard. Um, Fisk University has an African art collection that he himself helped reinstall but that he began to think much more directly and forcefully about um, being of African ancestry and thinking about the inheritable forms that are important to him. And he puts them um, directly into his work. And so there's a section of the exhibition where um, Michael is standing now, where you can see his thinking through drawings, through collage painting, through his sketchbooks, as well as um, some oil and acrylic paintings. And this selection of work, uh, I think, beautifully illustrates David's uh, ideas about um, how African aesthetics, African images, uh, for him serve as a gateway to the ancestral and his own uh, lineage, his own uh, heritage, right? Because uh, often you have uh, a face that's looking out at the viewer uh, and it's bifurcated. And in the case of our beautiful painting, Self-Portrait is Bainey, uh, we literally have on the right side uh, a realistic uh, portrait of David, self-portrait, and then on the left side, uh, the image of uh, a mask, a, a Benin hip mask. Right, so that doubling of um, often a um, more contemporary face with an um, African mask uh, appears throughout his work. I mean, we saw Bearden do that too in his work. Um, and David Driscoll was very conscious of that. There's even a work in the gallery that's an homage to, to um, Romary Bearden. And right, right there. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's a way of connecting the present to the past. So his acknowledgement of um, the significance of the African ancestral past to him. Um, and so when you bring it into a contemporary place and then call out to its historical resonance, it's like it's, it's constantly creating that um, bridge, right? It, the, the past is the present. And this is a beautiful um, painting which Driscoll also completed while he was at Fisk University that is a direct homage to Romary Bearden. Um, and it's sort of a nice sort of uh, at mask split bifurcated head that becomes part of this almost circular still life that seems to right. sort of imitate a Matisse. And then you have this background that suggests some of Bearden's own collage creation of these North Carolina landscapes. So it's it's really quite brilliant. Uh, you know, um, I sometimes think that uh, David Driscoll um, was thinking that this work was too close to Bearden, but for me, it's completely Driscoll. Um, yeah. in, at the same time, it is absolutely an homage to Romary Bearden. And again, we have this uh, sort of still life of hands that that leads your eye in this circular uh, sort of path in the composition, mm -hmm. but take you to this uh, bouquet of sunflowers, which are reamplified outside the window. So uh, your eye travels quickly at one point uh, as you sort of take in the figure, but then all of a sudden wanders uh, inside the interior, but then outside the window of, of the room. Uh, so yeah, it's a remarkable composition. And I think one of the things that Driscoll took from Bearden. Bearden was a colleague of his. Bearden went to visit him at Fisk University. Um, was he saw in Bearden an artist who made Southern folk life, um, lore and history, a classical story for paintings. And that's something that he really appreciated coming from the South himself. Which also instilled in him, I think, early on, right, a love for nature, which is really the next section of the exhibition deals with uh, nature and Maine and uh, the, the sort of leitmotif of the landscape and, and uh, the natural world. 
uh, which we get uh, in this uh, homage to Mary Bearden. So perhaps we can go into the, the next gallery. Sure, because I know look, we need to ask people want to ask questions too. Yeah. And uh, I'm a little bit nervous that my headphones are going to run out of power. <laughs> so sorry uh, if I feel I seem a little uh, on edge. I think my earphones are running out of gas. But this what? painting is in the High Museum's collection. It's called Upward Bound. It is. And why don't we stay right here and then allow people to ask um, questions as we get closer to time. Um, the, this was done in 1980. Um, in the summer of 1980, David Driscoll had this wonderful summer experience at um, Yado, which is an artist residency in Saratoga Springs. And um, he, which is also in this beautiful verdant <laughs> Um, nature place, just like Skowhegan, just like where he grew up in terms of um, Appalachia. And while he is there, he began to work very conscientiously on imagining collage painting as an idea that he gets from strip, strip quilting. And in fact, he told um, Dr. Lowry Stokes Sims, who also contributes to the, the exhibition catalog, um, um, back in the 80s, I think that, you know, he had a, a kind of a joke with his mother because he, his mother was a quilter and a, um, was really good, good quilter. Work. Yeah. And that he wanted to learn to do it. And, and his mother would say, it's not something that, a, you know, a boy does or a man does. So he's like, I'm going to do it anyway, and I'm going to do it with paint. So in this particular work, we see him masterfully create this large, painting on canvas in which he has collaged other painted canvas pieces to create that horizontal um, layering, that kind of sandwiching that you actually get there. But in the back of it is this almost de Kooning-esque kind of um, beautiful abstract painting. Um, and Driscoll was conscientiously thinking about um, strip quilting. He was dyeing them, painting them, tearing them up and reusing them. He's also fascinated again here by um, African strip um, weaving and those forms come to play and he will, when he works smaller, he'll do this in paper. But here we have this brilliant um, thinking about how can I um, create a quilt that is also a painting and in my own voice. And then in the horizontal strips, you see this beautiful calligraphic line um, of David Driscoll's as well as some of the um, background imagery and your circle, right? Right. The setting sun or the rising sun, both and. Both and, exactly. The title Upward Bound suggests it's perhaps a, a, a rising sun, but, and the composition itself has this sort of uplifting feel, almost as if it were a ladder, which can go up or down. Um, but the, the painting to me suggests cycles of regeneration, cycles of life. Uh, whether that's the cycle in a 24 hour period during a daytime or uh, cycles uh, in one's own uh, life. Um, you, I think you uh, really love uh, Flowing Like a River and, and that uh, really illustrates his use of uh, collage in terms of uh, paper collage in painting. So can right. we walk over to that one? Sure. So one okay. of the things that's less evident when um, when Driscoll paints and then tears up the canvas and uses them for quilted pieces, you don't, the edge of the torn or cut canvas is not as visible. But when he begins to think about paper as canvas and tear that up, which you see in Flo Flowing Like a River and some of the other works in this gallery, the edge of this beautiful heavyweight paper um, is the white edge that becomes this sort of jagged but ornamental contour line that makes the painted strip of paper really pop and it adds to this great kind of rhythm in all of his works but in flowing like a river in particular because you get that cadence in this case moving across instead of upward like the upward bound painting but that tear um, it seems so simple, right? I'm just going to tear a piece of paper, but look at the regularity of the width, right? Um, mm -hmm. And the choice 
to leave it like that, to see the ways in which that white edge, um, a little bit frayed, can actually create that sense of oscillation on the surface itself. So it, it's really quite brilliant. And while many people will think of um, this as a, call it a work on paper in the standard canon of sort of um, museum thinking, it really is a painting. Um, you know, Romary Bearden calls hit, called his collages montage painting. Um, David Driscoll and some other artists, um, Sam Middleton, for example, called their works collage painting, and I would have to agree. And it's interesting that line, that edge of the paper you're describing, for me, I always seemed to like an electrical charge, right? This kind of uh, really uh, living kind of element in the work. But it's something that uh, carries through the entire show in many ways, whether it's paint scumbled over, you know, uh, wet paint scumbled over dry paint, and you get these wonderful uh, edges that are abutting each other that have the same kind of uh, spark of, uh, you know, electricity almost. That's right. really wonderful. And, and sometimes he'll actually, um, not in this particular case, but he'll actually embed them in encaustic. So you get an even heavier surface that um, really kind of creates this beautiful sort of burnished wax um, uh, glaze on top. So they seem to be suspended um, within the composition. Well, let's look at the great encaustic work in, in this gallery while we're speaking about encaustic and his experimental use of different techniques. And that's uh, around this corner, Yama. Uh, it's titled Shaker, Chair and Quilt. And it's from 1988. So in the 80s, at the 80s were a time when David was really perfecting or, or really uh, becoming quite comfortable with this idea of collage painting, right? Yes. And encaustic. Yes. Um, and this beautiful work um, is, and you can see we've kind of come full circle, right? So it's not that gate leg table assemblage anymore. Instead, it is actually a chair with a quilt over it. And then beyond, behind that layer is this horizontal banding that we saw in Upward Bound. Um, and in this case, this kind of takes us back to Maine in particular. Um, the Driscoll residence in Maine. Um, the Driscolls had a residence in Maine as early as 1961. That's how much um, Maine became an important place for them. And not too far, probably about 20 minutes, um, was a Shaker community on Sabbath Day Lake. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, David Driscoll had a great interest in American furnishings and the beauty of some simple forms. So in this case, it really is a rethinking of a shaker chair with finials, a rethinking of a quilt kind of folded over it. But it is also this beautiful play of painting with collage um, that is his own collage. So no more print media included in this particular piece. Um, and a kind of joyful, um, playfulness of something that's imitating fabric and chair with paper. Right. And also you mentioned earlier his love of, of craft, uh, his love of uh, sort of the integrity of the object, which uh, when you think of a shaker furniture and, and shaker crafts, there is that simplicity, but also that uh, profound integrity of the object, which uh, is, I think, translated by David's work, in David's work, uh, through his love of materials, but not only the subject matter. Right, and without getting too, you know, scholarly about it, and that's sort of a pun, sort of when talk about the scholastic. So one of the things that David Driscoll did at um, Catholic University of America was he read a lot of um, scholastic texts. So he was really interested in St. Augustine. And of course, his, um, his own father was a minister. So he was well-versed in um, Christian philosophies and also aesthetic theory. So St. Augustine and his interest in Jacques Maritain, sort of the right form, right, in the right reason, um, really resonated with him. Well, my uh, earbuds have uh, officially died, so I hope you can hear me. Um, but maybe this is a good time for us to take questions. And my colleague, Melissa Katzen, is uh, remote, coming from her home. But uh, I've asked Melissa to field uh, some questions that have been uh, typed in our uh, 
comments field. Thanks, Michael. Um, yes, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them into our chat. Um, this isn't a question, but something that someone noted on in Julian, Michael, you touched on briefly is um, the circles that continue to show up in his works. Can you talk a little more about that while people are sending in some more questions? At this while we're answering that question. The circular motif seems to begin to appear, at least in the exhibition, uh, in terms of David's interest in the natural world um, as either uh, the disk of the sun or the moon. Uh, in this case, uh, I think it's this hot burning sun. Uh, it's a, this is the painting called da Dance of the Masks from 2000. And uh, it's, uh, it's a light motif, certainly in the work, but uh, what we didn't see earlier on was uh, a still life painting and a few related uh, studies, a print uh, study and uh, a drawing um, where the circular top of a table then is reamplified by the objects placed upon it. So uh, he, uh, in this wonderfully uh, inventive way, creates an abstract painting by reamplifying the form of this tabletop uh, with objects that can either be volumetric or flat. So playing with all these different formal ideas using this very simple motif. And I would just add that it, you know, it has, um, enormous symbolic potential, right? In terms of um, rebirth and renewal. Um, sometimes for um, David Driscoll, it would be a reference to African philosophy and the head as this really significant um, vessel, right? Of the soul. Um, so I, I think it, it, for him, it was um, not only a, a fabulous compositional device, right? Um, but that it had these multiple metaphors. But, um, yeah. um, another question we just received is, can you comment on the evolution of Driscoll's use of color and pigments? <laughs> Do you want to talk about that, Michael? Because you're a painter. You're an artist. <laughs> In addition to all the other things that you've done. <laughs> well, me, I'm not an artist. Well, <laughs> I think it's interesting that early on uh, at Skelly in 1953, he met Nana Bakur, who became uh, a force uh, in David's interest in materials. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think led to his a willingness to freely experiment with materials. So Nana Bakur's paint, Bakur paint uh, eventually became golden paint, which if you're a painter uh, in the audience, you probably are using golden paint right now. Um, but that plus the influence of someone like uh, Lois Maley Jones in terms of uh, her color sensibilities and, and uh, 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 influencing David in terms of uh, how he, his relationship to color uh, was translated, I think is uh, interesting. So early on in his career, he starts to, I think, establish a, a really comfortable relationship with, with color through experimentation. I think he's a brilliant colorist and he, I mean, you know, he did learn <laughs> color theory from Lois Jones, as Michael mentioned. And, you know, he also learned to um, grind his own pigments, is make it, make his own color. He learned fresco painting, he learned encaustic, he learned um, egg tempera. Um, and as Michael mentioned, you know, when he met Lenny Bocour at Skowhegan, it was just when Bocour was beginning to think about making acrylic because of course up until that time Driscoll was learning to um, paint in oil and he would get experimental paints from Lenny Bocour, Magna acrylic and then other acrylic paint. Um, but anyone who visited his studio would know that he never threw anything away. So he inherited some of Lois Jones' paints and pigments. Um, to, to look at a Driscoll painting is to understand that it probably has um, uh, paints and pigments manufactured in a contemporary sense, but also ones as old that he would have inherited. Um, so that sense of experimentation, um, why not mix oil with acrylic paint? <laughs> right, and with, Magna, you mentioned Magna or outfit paints, all of a sudden you could 
paints uh, in a, a very fluid way. Um, and you can extend uh, the duration of your uh, working through paint. Um, while at the same time, uh, the, the, the surface of the painting could dry so that we could uh, work into it again um, in a day or even during the same day. So I think that for a lot of artists, uh, Magnum was a uh, material that Roy Lichtenstein uh, discovered early in his career and stuck with it throughout the rest of his life. For that reason, you can have this really rich, um, unmodulated color, which uh, seems to be something that David became interested in, you know, in the late 60s, the, the use of, you know, saturated unmodulated color, yeah. but in a liquid fluid way. So when I asked him about it, uh, with the, the move to acrylic but not staying with acrylic so there aren't a lot of pure acrylic paintings by um, David Driscoll. Um, he liked that um, it would was less caustic sort of in the studio right than um, but than oil paint but he, he and the, the fact that it dried faster was a good thing but at the same time it, it didn't carry the kind of weight that oil painting did. And in some ways, I think what we see him doing, even in his collage and in caustic, is in putting that weight back into the work itself, right? What he could have gotten with oil, but he moves away from it, the reworking of the surface, he's doing in other ways with multiple materials. Right. There's a dimensionality of materials that uh, is belied by the, often the flatness of the composition. Right. Is there another question? Yes, we have um, one question that I think would be really great to be our final question. Um, uh, this um, visitor would love to know if Driscoll knew any of his own family ancestry since, since it is such a recurring theme in his work. I didn't quite catch the beginning of that question. Did you, Julie? No, sorry. Can sorry, you let me repeat it. They would love to know if Driscoll knew of his own family ancestry, since it is such a recurring theme in his work. I don't know if he did, for example, um, ancestry.com. We would need to ask his family members for that, but he certainly had knowledge of his grandparents um, and um, on uh, both the paternal and maternal side. And I just wanted to uh, change our view to this uh, work, The Farmer and His Wife, um, because it uh, gets to that question, maybe perhaps not to the ancestry part of it, but to the importance of family and family history in, in David's life and career. Right, and, and having um, ancestry, ancestral family members who were creative makers, builders, as well as um, uh, gardeners, right, crop growers, um, uh, basket and needlework and iron smithery. So working with, with the hands to create both um, useful objects and beautiful and aesthetic objects and create food, right? Right. And the one painting that we end the show in uh, does great chronology uh, in a dramatic way. But it, it's a painting that takes us back to 1955, speaking of uh, producing and growing your own food. Uh, it's a painting of uh, David's father's farm uh, here, a really lovely, a very um, honest and sincere portrait of this landscape. Right. And that's a, I, I describe that as the most, one of the most topographical works that I've seen him do. He does that. Um, he, he said he made that, um, my father's farm, on the way to, he stopped at home on the way to Talladega from Howard University. So transitioning from an undergraduate senior to his first professional job as he moves down to Talladega. So this is, um, as Michael said, corn in the tassel stage. It provides us a wonderful sort of punctuation at the end of the exhibition and uh, returns uh, you, uh, if you, when you come to visit the exhibition, to the beginning of the show, which begins in 1953. And uh, uh, I think it encapsulates the importance of David.
its own lived experiences uh, in his work. Um, so uh, I think uh, we're at the end of our uh, talk this evening. And Julie, I can't see you, but I want to thank you so much again <laughs> for being with us tonight uh, in the middle of a, a nice storm. And, um, and thank you so much for this extraordinary exhibition. Uh, I think it's a revelation to me, certainly, but to our audiences, I think it will be a revelation to get to know this side of David's art history uh, that much better. Indeed, thank you, Michael. Thank you to the High Museum of Art, the Portland Museum of Art, and thanks to everyone who came and hang out, hung out with us tonight. And um, if there's, one last thing I would say is, again, thank you to the Driscoll family. And Driscoll was a personal artist who made these fabulous intimate works. So if you can see the exhibition as it travels throughout the its multiple venues, please do. Absolutely. I'll add my thanks as well to the Driscoll family. We couldn't, have, of course, done this exhibition without their support and their generosity. So thank you from the High Museum. And to all of you who joined us tonight, thank you so much. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again at the next program. Have a good night.